Good morning, everybody. We would like to have a discussion this morning about the family meeting. As you know, I am interested in and do a lot of work in measuring caregiver burden and distress. And Terry do, does a lot of clinical work in helping families manage that distress. So we are going to have a, a dual presentation this morning. I'm going to review some of what the literature shows in terms of whether the family meeting is helpful or hurtful to family caregivers. And then Terry is going to spend the second half giving you clinical guidelines and also sharing a new tool that she's developed, which is going to be widely integrated both here and we hope elsewhere. So that's how we're going to do this morning. And feel free to interrupt and ask me questions as we go. Very surprisingly, although we hear so much about family meetings and they're considered the bread and butter of work in palliative care, very few studies have actually looked at when should family meetings be convened, how should they be conducted, who should attend, and does this in fact help or could it, heaven forbid, make things worse. And I want to tell you that there are some places uh, particularly I've seen in the ICU where every single family coming into the ICU gets a family meeting. In our setting, it's, it's called on an as-needed basis. So that's something that I want you to just think about. The possibility exists that if there's an unclear agenda or if communication goes badly, caregivers could end up feeling worse and they'll tell you if you ask them very dissatisfied and also when we've interviewed patients. Uh, I did a, a study, a, just an observational study of 15 family meetings with Paul DeSandra who worked here until the summer. Patients would often be very confused afterwards if we had not been very explicit about what were the goals of care, did they consent to have the discussion in front of family members, I have to tell you something, it sounds obvious and I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. If there's a patient who is able to even listen, doesn't, even if the patient can't participate, that patient should be part of the family meeting. And I hate to tell you how many times I see the family meeting done outside of the room and away from the patient. Not so much here, I hope, but in other settings, maybe where there isn't a specialist level palliative care program, because they figured it would be too upsetting or the, the family didn't want the patient involved. And Terry's going to talk a little bit more about that. How do you decide who should be involved? So limited data exists, but there is a growing body of data. Um, we, I can send you these and make a handout for you because these are really some top-notch um, citations and articles that you should read, particularly the first one. Arnold Back and Jim Tulsky have done really landmark work, mainly in the field of oncology communication, and I'm going to give you some of those uh, citations in a moment. So why have a family meeting at all? Well, common triggers are there's been a change in the medical status and you feel you need to tell the family as a whole. It's a transition in care. Maybe you need to align the, go the goals of care and there hasn't been good advanced care planning. Or you want to resolve some conflict or have so somebody make a decision. It could be patients, it could be surrogates. You need to think very carefully about when and why to have a family meeting because it is a lot of work and, you know, sometimes things go awry. When they're done well, family caregivers tell us that what they really got and when, when they really felt satisfied was when they got an assurance that the patient would not be abandoned <coughs> during the dying process. They'd be assured that the um, patient would be comfortable and wouldn't suffer and there'd be support for their decisions about end-of-life care. What I'd like you to remember from this slide is that if we involve family members in decision-making while the patient is alive, they have a lot less guilt and they adjust better in the bereavement phase. And so this is a good pro, a reason for doing the family meeting if it's done well. 
So what are the opportunities that exist in the family meeting that are better than perhaps just talking to people individually? Well, it really provides a very safe setting in which caregivers' needs can be addressed directly. You can give everybody comprehensive information together at the same time so that there's no communication breakdown afterwards. Discussion of caregivers' feelings really does reduce psychological distress and it's a very good opportunity for us as professionals to express empathy and show active listening. And here are some things that other people have found helpful, um, just some ways of getting going. Some people find that the most difficult part is what to say at the beginning. And I know that Terry's going to discuss that in a moment. Um, you know, so all of these are good statements. And to always wrap up at the end, are there any questions that you had that you don't feel that we've answered yet? You never know what you're going to get, but it's a good thing to ask because if you don't, you know they're going to come up later. So here are some of the structural and process issues that we need to think about every time we call a family meeting. Who calls the meeting? Is it the family? Is it the doctor? Is it the social worker? Is it the nurse? Do the staff and family agree on an agenda? Believe it or not, you're supposed to work this up before. What does everybody know and what do they want to know? It's very important who attends from both sides, staff and family, because you know the dynamics and the, the way it goes is going to change depending on who's there. Where does the meeting happen and when does it begin and when does it end? So let me tell you about a quick anecdote about one of the, the meetings that I did with Dr. DeSandra. I was there as an observer, but I, I'll tell you, I had to sit on my hands because I, my you know, clinical tendency to jump in and, and say something was difficult to control, but I was there to observe. I didn't want to become part of the process. So he was leading the family meeting, and there was the mother of the patient, I mean, the daughter of the patient, her husband, and two kids. The patient was not involved in the room. And there was the doctor and me. 20 minutes into the meeting, the social worker came in. I'm sure she was involved in clinical care. I didn't know she was there. I would have told them to hold the meeting. But it was very difficult because she came late and had to catch up. 30 minutes into the meeting, an attending arrived from medicine who I've seen around, I don't, still don't know what his role was. I think he was a friend of the family. He arrived, he sat there with a cap and a coat, meaning like he had one foot out the door. I wasn't sure how long he was staying. And he jumped in and gave advice. And you could see that the do Dr. DeSandra did not expect him. And 40 minutes into it, the chairman of medicine arrived because there was a slight chance that if the patient had surgery, her blockage in her, in her, you know, GI tract would be resolved. Now, I have to tell you, I thought that the doctor did a superb job because he just kept going. But, but this could be a movie of how not to run a family meeting because every time people arrived, he had to stop, introduce them. So in an ideal world, everybody should be there at the beginning and everybody should know and wear their ID badges and not wear their cap and not wear a coat but it doesn't always happen like that in the real world, so I guess some flexibility is also good. Who speaks for the family? And are you sure that you have the right person? You know, I just read an article, the title of which is The Daughter from California. I've been worrying about The Daughter from California for years, and it's actually a phenomenon, meaning it's a family member that has a lot of decision-making power in the family, who's not part of the day-to-day -day activities, but arrives just in time to, you know, throw a spoke into the wheel, so to speak, and make you realize that the family is not only the people that you've been seeing every day. So very important to do that assessment. Who summarizes the meeting in the chart? You know how important documentation is. How the, the work is summarized is very important because it's going to lead to disposition and decision making 
and I'm going to show you that follow-up is just as important as doing the work in preparation up front. So we never promised you a rose garden. We never said this work was easy. Here are some of the roadblocks. Also, we call them bloopers sometimes. What, you know, one should avoid saying if possible. If the family says, you know, you decide, you tell us what to do. Don't give us too much information. That's a hard place to be, but you have to recognize and respect their defenses. If you get into a um, keeping of secrets because the patient doesn't want the family to know or the family doesn't want the patient to know, it's a slippery slope. You're walking on eggshells and it's a very tough place to be. But you know, if my colleague John Choi was here, he would say that you have to respect the cultural reality of that family or else you know that everything is gonna break down when you leave the room. So you have to negotiate and find out what's comfortable for that family, which Terry is going to get into as well. If there's significant family conflict, the family meeting is not the place to resolve this. You're not going to be able to resolve long-standing family conflict in an hour. If there are hidden and competing agendas between staff members, between staff and family, be careful because those are going to, to torpedo the agenda and take you off in a different direction. Very bad if staff disagree in front of the family, but it's sometimes inevitable. It's better if you could provide a you, you know, united front because otherwise it leaves them very confused. And power struggles, better to have them outside of the room, not in front of the family. So to the extent possible, I'd like you to take home the fact that the agenda should be explicit. Everybody there should know what you're going to discuss. Don't throw things on the family that they didn't expect either. What is, what is your priority as a professional and what is the priority for the family? And as I said, please do remember the cultural needs and approaches. That's what makes the work so challenging but also so interesting and why a place working in Beth Israel is more fun. Family caregivers have needs in and of themselves. Please try to make sure that we don't see them and that our colleagues don't see them as an appendage of the patient. They're not there just to take the patient home and give you that bed that, that you need. If there are different agendas, the family's emotions should take priority. We were once involved in a family meeting where we had one agenda, but the family wanted to know what would happen to the patient when she died and would they be able to take care of the body and the burial. They had already moved there. We had to go where they were at because we had a completely different agenda. It's very supportive for caregivers if we listen to them and we acknowledge their expertise as caregivers, but also their suffering. And to the extent possible, it's better to negotiate who's going to lead the family meeting before you start. This is Onco Talk, which I think is a very good vehicle. They come up with all these, you know, mnemonics. There's a preparation phase, the talk phase, and the follow-up. They actually give um, wonderful things to say. This is geared towards oncologists, but I find that it's very generalizable to our population, to palliative care. If your mom was sitting here at the table, what would she, what would she say? I don't want you to feel you're making medical decisions on your own. That's my job. Let's start off by saying what your mom would have wanted if she were here. And if you look back on this six months from now, I want to make sure that we did what your mom would have wanted. Some of it is a little scripted and you don't ever have to say that. You have to trust your gut and you have to find what's comfortable. But I think it's very good, especially for trainees and beginning um, oncologists to have that language. So some of the um, difficulties are when the family wants you to follow a line of treatment that you think is medically futile that is a reason to call a family meeting and is often discussed. Or if they say we want to seek a second medical opinion, uh, it's a very good place to offer support services and to say, do you think you could speak to the social worker 
or the chaplain or the psychologist about that. It sounds like there is some ongoing issues going on. And at the close, it's very important to summarize the content. So I just want to go over what we discussed today. Here's what we discussed. Here's what the next steps are. And here's what we didn't resolve because we're going to order another test. And based on that, we're going to make a decision. We're going to do A or B so that everybody is on the same page. And that summary is what should go into the chart. What should we not say? Do you want us to do everything? Do you want us to stop everything? We're very sorry. There's nothing more we can do. I hate to tell you this, but 10, 15 years ago, that was the mantra that when the palliative care team arrived, the family had just been told, there's nothing more we can do, but here, here are these people, and um, you know they're going to deal with you, and they're going to pick up the pieces. That's not how we see specialist level palliative care at all. You have failed chemotherapy, pulling the plug, very popular in the 70s and the early 80s, not a term that we use anymore, and I'm sure you could come up with a list of your own. Other things that we should not do is it's so easy to give pathophysiology lectures, to draw a drawing of how, you know, the, what's going on inside the body and not realize that this is freaking people out or losing them. If family members get a glazed look and start looking out the window, you're probably using too much jargon. Slow down, check in, how is this going on? You need to find out if the patient wants to be there. We had this wonderful 94-year-old patient who did not speak a word of English who had to go to a nursing home and could no longer live on her own. There were family members that had flown in from all over the country and were absolutely wonderful, but were going to have the discussion in the family room on our unit. The doctor checked with the patient through a translator and said, do you want to be involved in this discussion? And she said to him something really like funny, but very insightful. She says, I'm an old lady. You think I don't know what's going on? Of course I want to be involved in the discussion. And we moved it into the room. Everybody squirmed, but that's what she wanted. It was absolutely the right thing to do. Launching into the agenda without negotiating the focus of the interview. So when you start, you say, we are gathered today. Well, that sounds pretty religious, right? We are here today because we are going to discuss um, some new tests and some new findings involving your care or your mom's care. Is that everybody's understanding of why we're here today? And also, if people start to cry or get upset, giving tissues is okay as long as you don't offer premature reassurance and cut off the discussion. People need to be able to express their feelings, and you can't rush these things. And also, you can't make decisions in one encounter. This is one way. This is a good way. But if you think it's all going to be wrapped up after this, it's, un it's unlikely. So don't try to short-circuit the conversation. If one family member is more active, check in on the others. And we've discussed telling and keeping secrets. So just to end, some of the cultural differences that you'll come up with are communication preferences, keeping the diagnosis a secret from the patient. This can make the caregiver feel more burdened and more responsible. But it is a reality that we often feel torn between patient and caregiver needs, and that needs to be sorted out and, and, and worked out. If you're working with people who want to avoid the terms death and dying and think that talking about these things is bad luck, it's very difficult to do advanced care planning. There are ways, but you're going to have to work on those. So document who is there. Make sure that's available in the chart. Check in or have somebody who's going to follow up, check in with the patient and family to see how the family meeting went. Is there, is there anything you didn't get to? And you can always provide additional information afterwards. As I say, it's not a one-shot deal. It's just part of the process. 
So in an ideal setting, the family meeting is really supposed to be a safe place in which family caregivers can express and process very powerful emotions. It offers us the opportunity to validate their concerns and offers them the opportunity to get recognition, help and support from trained professionals. It is a good forum for surrogate decision making if done properly and also for us to affirm that we're not going to abandon them or the patient and to take it from there. So I wanted to stop now, see if there's one or two questions and then Terry is going to pick up and get more into the clinical you know, realm and clinical guidelines for doing this work. So any questions or comments so far? Okay, so then I'll hand it over to you. So actually, I'm going to get into the clinical guidelines. Uh, I, um, the clinical aspects of this work are shared responsibility, and many of us have different ways that we view the world, and that's why on our better days we have an interdisciplinary group um, organizing and participating in the family meeting. What I wanted to do, rather than <coughs> take a half hour to do clinical, um, uh, clinical teaching, which I think um, we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis when we participate with each other and do family meetings together. The way I want to, to work on this next half hour is to give you what the department created one year ago as a format for family meeting. It is a form that uh, many of us worked on, not just me. Um, and it talks about some of the clinical issues, but in a different kind of way. So if you would take one of these, and the other thing that I brought for you, because Dr. Eddie did send us an email, I don't know if you all got it, um, has to do with this palliative care communication assessment of how we behave in a family meeting and the aspects of our participation that are really great and don't need any change other than adapting to the family that is in front of us and those other aspects that in fact do need to be paid attention to because we're not so hot at them. So if you would take a copy of that as well because if we really get organized around this for the next six months then these are the documents we ought to be using when we're working together debriefing, pre-briefing before we go into a family meeting. So I really wanted to make this um, very functional in terms of our educational goals within the department. Um, so, um, if you take a look at this, oh, before we even, I'm sorry, do you have, did you get the other one? Okay. If, before we even talk about these forms, one of the things that um, somebody taught me a while ago that I want to share with you is, is that the way we organize a family meeting the way we set up the space, the way we choose and decide who's going to be there, the way we enter the room, all of that is a demonstration not only of our professionalism but the respect that we have for the work that we do and the family that we're sitting down with. So if when we think about doing a family meeting, we need to be thinking upstream. We need to be thinking about the space we're going to use. Yesterday we had a family meeting on nine Daisian, and we walked out into the hall and we said we need to find a private space. And one of the sons said to us, no, no, it's okay, we're discussing things out in the hall all the time. And we said, no, it's not okay. And Dr. Shinar emptied out a room to create a space for this family. I, I'm not sure if that wasn't in part what diminished some of the anger, the importance that, that we all placed on the fact that this was confidential information, it was not discussed in the hall, and Dr. Shinar made a, grant, a, a really great attempt to clear a space for us to continue the family meeting. So, it's, uh, so when we do this together, and uh, I'll take full responsibility for sometimes driving you all crazy, and I accept that as part of what I do here, um, we need to think before we go in the room, not as we go in the room. So that's part of what this form is designed to do, to be an, um, a, a clue, a clue to us to take a look at it and say, what do we need to be thinking about before we sit down with this family? Sometimes we are sort of postscript. Oftentimes in the MICU, we are attached to the MICU physicians who are doing a certain task because it's time for them in their perception to do this task with the patient and the family, and we are an add-on. We don't always have control over that. Um, sometimes we're called at the last minute, sometimes they have no time for these kinds of things, but we 
when we are coordinating family meeting, we need to be thinking on um, how do we demonstrate respect for this process, respect for the work that we're doing, and most importantly, respect for the patient and the family. So one of the things, uh, before I forget it, because I will, the daughter from California, there's no reason anymore, given the technology that we have, that the daughter from California is not beamed into our family meetings. If these folks are really important, we can figure out through technology, cell phones, speaker phones, whatever it is, how to get them there, even though they're not there in their physical presence. Um, because once again, um, uh, we have technology now. There's no excuse for not being able to do that if we're able to think ahead about planning these meetings. And this is, so what I'm talking about is an ideal. On a day-to-day -day basis, we work with the practical aspects of what this work is, which has to do with uncertainty, and we're sometimes flying by the seat of our pants. But oftentimes, it is so important to wait an hour and say, we have to get this person who's wherever they are, China, wherever they are, into this conversation because the, the issues are so profound and it's so important to the family in terms of having them be able to make a decision. Sometimes our, chi our Chinese families have people and then we'll make a decision till the person from China is back in town and such like that. So we, we really need to figure out, is there a way to support them and bring the people in um, to the work that need to be brought into the work? So you'll see at the top of this, this is a very simple kind of thing, um, but the participants, it says participants here. It says participants, but that's not simple. Deciding who the participants need to be is part of the preclinical work. It's part of the pre-medical work. If, in fact, what we're talking, do you have enough? Uh, does somebody want to go out and make a copy? That would be really great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Allison. Hmm? There's, uh, well, I don't know. People seem not to, not to have one. So, um, Part of the preclinical work is deciding who needs to be there. And for many of our oncology patients, the, uh, in addition to MICU staff, us, uh, oftentimes the oncologists need to be there. Many of our patients have been treated by oncologists for, for years and years and years, and they have very important and meaningful relationships, and they know the history in a way that we do not know at all. So that's part of the pre-planning and thinking that through so that when we sit down in a room or when we look at a chart, we don't see a note from one of the oncologists which, which says, I was not aware of this family meeting. I cannot be here because I have office hours. You don't really want to see that in the chart because this is the oncologist that we know cares deeply about his patients, discusses advanced directives, and participates in the lives of his patients and families. So you don't really want to see that. You want to you know, you want to be able to have worked as hard as you could work to get that person there rather than having them assert in the chart that they weren't told about the meeting. And sometimes we do that, uh, and sometimes other people, I just need one too. Sometimes other folks do that. Doesn't matter who does it, this is shared work. What matters is that it gets done. The bl blurred boundaries, which trouble people sometimes because it's very difficult, maybe, maybe when, uh, I'm not sure exactly what makes it more difficult for some people and others. Blurred boundaries are a part of palliative care. Um, they're a part of working as a consult service with other people. The boundaries get blurred. What we have to figure out is who's going to do the work, not the other way around, which is to, to artificially um, sort of surgerize who does what. We need to figure out how to get the work done, and sometimes that um, depends on the person who has the most relationship, the prior existing relationship with the family and such like that. So participants, who invites the family? Who does that? Is it social work? Because social work knows the family. Is it Sharon? That's a clinical decision. How do you want to build a success? You want to build a success, you want to build comfort for them, not for us. That's, that's our goal, right? Comfort for them, not for us. Um, now we have a situation, while this says healthcare proxy, now we have a situation because we have the new surrogacy law where um, uh, people, of course, can be surrogates. But if there is somebody that has been designated a proxy, designated an agent, that should say agent, because we're talking about the person, I think. Um, if there's been somebody who's been designated, that person needs to be there. If I, have a, as a, a patient, have decided that you're going to be my healthcare agent, I've made that decision, we need to figure out, we need to, even though in the setting of the surrogate law, we need to figure out if there is an agent and make sure that that relationship and that choice um, is acknowledged in the meeting because that does give a person a certain responsibility and a certain role to play, sometimes an overwhelming role. 
and sometimes they give it up to family and things become uh, family decision making decision making processes um, so you can see here this the goal of this is to be able to have it as a document in the chart we can't just do that as a palliative care service. So if we spend some time thinking about how to pilot this, if it seems useful to people, then maybe we will go to the forms committee and ask them if we can put this in the chart. And then it will become a reflection of the work that we do. We do not, uh, we, we're much more vigilant about writing what happens in a family meeting than the MICU staff is. All you will see in their notes is family meeting held. You don't see a lot of the process. You don't see the decision, how the decisions were made, what the variables were that were considered. And that's a, a little bit problematic because if people come back to look at that chart, and, and that becomes the document, the reflection of our work. So right now, um, we had a family meeting, a very, very complicated family on Five Linsky. After the meeting, there was no note in the chart, essentially, about what occurred in that family meeting, nor who was there. So this would be a very nice contribution to the institution and would help our colleagues in the ICUs who, or who are very busy and don't perceive this to be part of their, the specificity of it, part of their mission. It would be really helpful to them if we could pilot this and see if it is useful to the task of creating family meetings that are most meaningful and most beneficial, not only to patients and families, but also to the institution. We have to decide before we go in the room who's going to be the leader of the meeting. Sometimes it's the doctor, and sometimes it really ought not to be the doctor at all. It ought to be somebody who has prior history. It ought to be a psychosocial person. It ought to be a psychologist. There, there should be thinking that goes into that decision, not automatic that the physician leads the family meeting. Sometimes they're at a total loss, which is why some of them around the country love to have psychosocial people, social workers there, psychologists there, because they realize that we have some knowledge of family dynamics, group dynamics, and we'll save them if they get in over their head. And that's a very positive thing. I think if people count on us for that, I, you know, bless their souls. You need to know what your limits are of what you do well and what you need help with. And our families, no matter how you prepare, all families are not predictable. And if they are so predictable that every family meeting becomes a rote kind of meeting, then we probably have too much control over the process. Um, so, the other, like, huh? I would think about it as live, you know, like when you talk yes. about like Saturday Night Live, I yeah. mean, it is live, and you really, it's unpredictable, like you said, and you have to be prepared for anything, and yeah. also have the skill to, like, bring it back onto the agenda, back on focus, yet still deal with all those feelings and emotions expressed. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that process means that you acknowledge it, mm -hmm. show respect for it, and say we will work on that later. Da 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 da. -da. So it's it's um, so the the essential the, the, the listening and knowing that we have a time frame, that we have a time limit. One of the things that and and yet being respectful of everything that people present to us and trying to figure out how we can be helpful. One of the things that's really um, interesting to me, and I don't think anybody has done any work on it, is really the cost of family meetings. How that costs out in terms of the outcome, because we often have, and yesterday, what did we have, six clinicians in that room? Mm -hmm. We had six clinicians in a room. That's expensive. It absolutely is expensive, and did we need them all? Certainly, we had some pre-planning discussion, and I thought we did. I don't know how you feel at the end of it. I know we needed two physicians in that room. I, I know we needed two physicians in that room. So, but, but nobody looks at that, and it's just interesting for us to think about who is necessary for this process. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the entire team. Doesn't necessarily mean that. It may be, it may not. Sometimes what I found, we used to have weekly meetings because we were in a rehab center. So that was the good thing is every week we, we had a lot of family meetings, and we included the patient um, if they wanted to be. But um, it's just so interesting as far as yesterday's was called by the patient really it was it was the set up from the patient and a very angry patient and what we saw with our weekly meetings is sometimes just looking around when they see all those healthcare providers they they are so impressed that all of this work is going to either their care if they're the patient or their loved one's care that that can diffuse a lot of anger which is what <coughs> probably happened yesterday because we went into it with lots of anger. Yeah. 
Um, the question of the numbers of health care providers also, um, this is something we don't talk about a lot. There is a power differential. When families come into a room and there are six white coats sitting around, there is a message in that. So we really need, if we want, if we truly want to set up a family meeting where it's a collaborative process and a negotiation, not us wanting the outcome that we want when we walk out of the room, that's, that's a, you know, an agenda that some of us may or may not have, um, then we really need to be worried about the power differential. differential. And for some families, large numbers mean we care. For other families, large numbers shut down communication um, because of their culture, because of their values, their belief, whatever it is, what, their psychology. So, um, so I think that can cut both ways. Yeah, yeah. And so when we see perhaps that our numbers are cutting down communication, then we need to work harder. Yeah. We just need to work harder to, to see if we can help them to actually express their authentic feelings, not what they think we want, what they think we want to hear. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, so the, the conference facilitator gets to decide before we walk in the room, and that's a responsibility. We didn't know exactly who was the facilitator. We knew that Dr. Shinar had to be central to the process that went on. So in that sense, I think he was the facilitator, and we were, yeah, yeah. So who was going to be that person? And that person has responsibility. He didn't know he had responsibility as a facilitator. Um, but because I think uh, you know we're we're thinking about this, but others are not exactly thinking about that. Do you got, do you all in family medicine talk about family meetings from the sense of who's the facilitator, who's responsible for guiding the process, who's going to be in charge? Yeah, I mean, oftentimes I think um, the attendings you know the patients more because we just sort of rotate through as residents. But yeah. for a lot of our patients who are frequently admitted, mm -hmm. a lot of the attendings are more aware of sort of the, the family dynamics as well as the social worker. So I think that discussion happens on that level, and it sort of trickles down to us, and we are participants. So a lot of times, the truth, we're observing, because you know, this is a, a difficult process to learn, and something that takes time and experience, and you know, we'll jump right. in when is appropriate, but a lot of times, it's the attending and the social worker. Right. And obviously, you guys, too, because you help us. Yeah. So then uh, another question and another thing that we uh, need to be doing more and more is the debriefing afterwards. It's because you will be in a family meeting with each other, with all of us, and you may see things that you wonder, what, what, what was going on in Terry's brain when she said that? You know, why did she ask that medical question? What is, what is the matter with her? Um, there is a thinking that we all do as, 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 our, as clinicians. You do the thinking as physicians, you do as a nurse practitioner, and as um, uh, all that encompasses in that role. I do as a social worker, you do as a chaplain, a psychologist. We are thinking during that process. We're not just sitting there we, you know, with information poured at us. We are thinking. So you can, we need to count on each other. When one of us opens our mouths, it is because we have a clinical purpose. And it doesn't mean the clinical purpose is to challenge anything that's being said, but the clinical purpose is because we may have observed something that you have not observed in body language, in facial expression. We know the patient from before. So we're weaving in something that may seem foreign to you, but you need to hold us accountable for the clinical purpose. So if you think it's foreign, then you say to me, Terry, you were off base. What was going on? Um, and then we have a conversation about my thinking and your thinking, and we figure it out because that's what collaboration is about, and that's what working with, w as a team is about. So um, just know that each of us, if you can count on us as specialists, and you're growing, you know, we're like I've been hanging around for a number of years, in case you hadn't noticed the gray hair. Um, and so, uh, you know, I have a, a perspective that may be very different because I'm listening with different ears. But that doesn't mean that you, but what I need from all of you, what you need from me is to say to you, where were you going with that, Sharon? I, I, need, to, I need to understand how you were thinking about that because um, that will help me to understand how you were thinking about it. That's a mutual, a shared responsibility for people who work in a team um, that, um, that absorbs conflict, works with conflict, and difference of opinion. Okay, <clears throat> so the staff focus may very well be different than the family focus. Um, and you know, there are some facilities, and I think one of them is in uh, uh, Minnesota, 
Fairview, which is a very, very, um, one of the demonstration projects for the palliative care, for CAPSI, for the Center for the Advancement of Palliative Care. They have flyers where families can ask for family meetings. They have a flyer which says, what is a family conference? What is a family meeting? And it describes what the family meeting is, a family conference, with the idea that it can be generated from anybody um, and that families ought to have the <coughs> invitation, that's an invitation, to ask for a family meeting. That's a very interesting institutional culture to do that. That's, that's a representation of an institutional culture. So, uh, so what's the staff focus? Um, and then a, 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 some kind of description about who the patient is. Um, we don't do that enough. Um, and I don't just mean who the patient is in the medical sense, because we're going to get to that. But who is the person? If the person isn't there, how do we understand who this person is that we're talking about? I've heard Dr. Corey say, tell me, who is your mother? Tell me a little bit about the person of your mother. I need to know who is your mother. And then families will say she was a very active person, she loved being dead. You know, whatever it is that they say about her. She's very spiritual, she's not. But it allows families, especially when patients aren't there, um, to bring the patient into the room and also for us to get beyond the body and the tests and all that we have to tell them about what's going on medically to who is this person, who is the person that we're talking about. So that's what that's designed to do. You need to know that this is a compilation of many forms used across the country. We, you know, we just got a bunch and put something together that was one page because we knew one page was important um, and also seemed to make sense to those of us that were working on it. So it's not created here, it's a compilation. Um, oh, and the other thing that Dr. Yuri used to be so good about is he would always ask, tell me how your mother, how your sister, how your child was acting, was, what was their life before this medical event? And that really gives us context. And it gives you an idea of what a shock it is, right? The family that we met with yesterday. She was out in the world. She was taking care of her grandchildren who are babies. And then she has this cardiac thing and she's dying. And she has such a terrible heart that she can hardly breathe, no less take care of her grandchildren. That's in a month. And we wonder why they don't get it. That's our phrase. Why don't they get it? Because they don't get it in the time that we have to help them to get it. So. So what's the pre-admit status? And when you hear that, you can all, often also put it in a medical context. Dr. Lesage does that beautifully. You know, how were they functioning before? Well, for the last two months, she was losing weight. She wasn't as active as she was. And then the family is allowed to give you their perception, and you can help them to understand the meaning of what they observed, the meaning of that. So um, uh, it's really a very nice dialogue that you're really having about medical issues, but you're having the dialogue based on the representation of what the family has observed um, in the patient. It's a very, very different kind of conversation. Both of those two content areas are yeah. so inherently valuable. But the other thing, as far as the strategy that I see happening, is it gets the family members or the patient talking and they say coming out of a family meeting, if the patient family talked more, they are more satisfied yes. with the process. And that yep. would be a critique of yesterday is, is the family didn't talk much. But there's strategies to really get it, like you said, a dialogue. Yes. Yes. And while yesterday they didn't talk much, I thought that they got a lot of information. I mean, they were asking medical questions that needed medical you know, why this, why that, and so on and so forth. And then once we got a little bit past that, we were able to talk about other aspects of, of the care. An, that would be an interesting thing to look at, Terry, because yes. as you and I know, um, if people study how we interact with patients, mm -hmm. they find, with all due respect to the physicians in the room, that physicians interrupt the patient yes. and the family member within, like, seconds Oh, do you mean this? Do you mean that? Yeah. So I'd be seven very, seconds. Seven, it's seven seconds. seconds is yeah. the area. I is that right? Eight. Seven. No, but it was oh, seven, down. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much to cover and Please. we get anxious you as know. well. So it would be interesting you know to talking. look at whether they're more satisfied if they participate more. And it more. has been looked at. University of Washington and has researched. And they were. The yes. more the family spoke, yes. the more. So that's exactly. very interesting and something we should think about for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We could actually time each other. That would be a riot. That's how they do. That would be sort of funny, you know? I don't know how you would do that quietly. 
very quietly. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so the pre-admit status is, is a really um, a, a nice thing to explore with families. So then these are sort of, of um, you know, what we do all the time has to do with the, the presentation of the medical status. Oftentimes we will ask people, and I just got such a kick out of one family, we will ask people, what do you understand about the medical situation? Or however we ask that question. And one day, I can't remember, the family was like, you know, how many times? What are you, what are you talking to me about? What I, is I think that they were asked that question a lot of times, and they realized that it must be something that, you know, and they were frustrated with it. They had had it. Um, but it really does, um, if you can help families to tell us where their understanding is that really helps. If you, if you, there's a social work principle, it's called start where the patient is. That you don't start where you are, you ask, ask the person, you know, what, what do you understand? Where are you in this process? Because that guides how we can help them the best. And so that question is an, is an important question. What do you understand about the medical situation? And it really does sometimes help them guide the pace of information that is given um, and the kind of information that is given. Yeah, I thought you were going to say something, but I know you will when you want to. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that. Oh, yes, just because I did this for years and people keep doing it, and, and one day a light went off in my head. The whole idea of designating one family member as spokesperson is incongruous with the complexity of medical information that we deliver to families. Because we are asking, and we, we still, we're still doing this, decide one family member who we're going to talk to, we're going to give that family member medical information, and that family member is going to tell you all. And then we wonder why the family is confused. We give complex medical information to a non-medical person who may be emotionally involved, has an amazing job as a caregiver, that's a, a profound role as a caregiver to be the medi intermediary between staff and, and the rest of their family. That's a profound role. It can be very complex. And if you're a personality that needs to be in control and really loves it, it even gets more complex because there may be a power issue in it. So that's the clinical aspect of this work that you all need to count on some of us who are in the psychosocial, psychological field to be thinking about when you're there. But that idea, when, you, when it comes to your mind, just ask yourself, is this right in this family? Because what you are doing is giving that person the responsibility of communicating to all the others through their own emotion, their own suffering, their own psychology. Um, and and it, I'm not sure how smart that is in terms of what it is, what our goal is. Our goal is sometimes to make our life less complex because we don't want to keep repeating things. But maybe an answer is to have another family meeting. You know, you plan then when, as you're leaving, we will meet again in a week, we will meet again in two days, we will meet again tomorrow afternoon to see where we are, where we are with this. So, and now in these days of technology, once again, we can do that less and less because we can get people technologically connected to us in a way that we were unable to do for years and years. Yes? One of the things I noticed <clears throat> is that sometimes a spokesperson in the family are chosen are other people who have a more pragmatic way of, of behaving, like kind of a more pragmatic way of grieving. Mm -hmm. So they kind of keep it more together, they're more pragmatic, they don't ask too many questions, and so it makes it easier for providers to deal with them. But there may be implicit spokespersons in the family that we're not able to identify unless we really do a deeper work, like Terry was saying. And they, those people who don't necessarily talk or have a more um, as it's described in the literature, intuitive or expressive way of grieving, you know, they may not be directly spokespersons in the family, but they have a lot of power, and they may not talk during the family meeting, but then the problem may come out after the family meeting, and then we say, well, it went so well. What happened? I'm coming all these questions. And it's not so much because it wasn't discussed at the family meeting, but because there were other people, the, the stakeholders, who had a lot of uh, power but did not really talk because of their style. So that's something to keep in mind. Yes, yes. It's, it also, um, now that you've raised grie grief and bereavement, uh, um, we're all doing grief and bereavement on a daily basis. The way you work with families, the way you work with 
the way we deliver information, the way we manage pain, the way we manage symptoms impacts grief and bereavement. So it's not so partialized, and that's what you're raising as well. It's not so partialized that these are the grief and bereavement experts. When, when, you, when you think about, and I think about this a lot, that the way we manage symptoms in a patient impacts the mourning and the grief of the family. If their patient is comfortable, and we've helped them to be comfortable. Then you have a different kind of mourning, a different kind of process, but maybe it doesn't contain words like, she was in excruciating pain till the end of her life, or she couldn't take a breath till the end of her life. And maybe it doesn't uh, contain those words. So I th it's nice to think that you, on a daily basis, are contributing to the mourning of the family in the way that you care and respect for their patient. I like that. It makes me think that I have influence beyond the life Right beyond the life, and I yeah Sometimes yeah. Somebody taught me once that once. Yes, a patient taught me that. Yeah. Correlate with less complicated grief after yeah. the death. Yeah. Just a single biggest projection. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that's just uh, it's not exactly about family meeting, but it's nice to think about um, because it, it's nice to think about it, but it also gives us a profound responsibility, mm -hmm. right? And and you know, and that's what we're here. You know, we're specialists, so that's the responsibility you take. So. Uh, um, and hopefully we're helping each other to do it on a daily basis. So the areas of consensus, this implies that there may be areas where we have consensus and areas that we do not have consensus. Um, but it's nice to figure out where we have consensus and to say that out loud. We, we didn't do that yesterday. We, one of us could have done that. One of us could have very reasonably said, let's stop for a minute. This is what we understand, brothers. Is this what you understand? Um, and that would have been a way of making sure that we were at least maybe hearing the same thing because we could have that done that. that would have been appropriate is what happened in that family meeting is there was a division with two parallel discussions going on uh -huh. with two brothers. And that would have been a time to yes. bring it back together and, and, and summarize. Right, exactly. And any one of us could have done that. Mm -hmm. in that. In that meeting yesterday, theoretically, if you had a facilitator who took the responsibility for, for being facilitator in that meeting, that would be the job of the facilitator. You would have to count on them for that skill and for pulling it together. Um, but yesterday, we didn't have really a facilitator. Any one of us could have done that. Um, so areas for further clarification, that gives us each a sense of what our jobs are, you know, what we need to be looking at, if we need to get more information, if it's from a discharge planning issue, if it's whatever the issue is that we need to be, be working on because in spite of the fact that some of us more than others need more certainty in our lives, oftentimes we leave family meetings with tons of uncertainty and some consensus, but Medical situations are uncertain, emotional situations, discharge planning is sometimes uncertain. Somebody can change from today to tomorrow. Somebody can be dead from today to tomorrow. And then everything, you have a different. So we oftentimes leave with some uncertainty, things to be done. Um, but when we leave, um, it would be very nice for us to be able to pull that together in a way that everybody knows what their responsibility is and the family has a sense of who's going to be doing what. That's the next part, next steps, and by whom, not just the next steps, who takes responsibility for A, B, and C. Because um, in a shared, uh, palliative care is shared work. If that's just the nature of palliative care. Um, uh, so, so, but somebody ultimately has to be responsible for doing some of the concrete stuff. Sometimes for that, you know, that's like who makes a medical appointment for the next person. And then who completes this form? In some settings at the Cleveland Clinic, social workers have a different kind of form. The social workers are responsible for completing the family conference form. But that's just what they do at Cleveland Clinic. I, you know, we, you can do anything you want. You can rotate who fills out the form. Um, and then the other question is, you know, who, who also, I think there should be, or maybe also somebody needs to read it just like you would read as an attending. You would read a medical note and say, yes, this is what happened. This is what we all understand. Not all understand, but an attending understands, yes, this is the outcome of that meeting. Because so much of it, if I write it and so much of it is medical, I want somebody to be reading it who says, yes, you got that right, or no, you know, and edits it, because it, if, it, if it ever becomes a part of the permanent chart, you want it to reflect with accuracy, because um, it is the record of what we do for a living. And it is yeah. part of the permanent record when you enter that note. 
progress. Well, actually, now, even though we're not using yeah. this, we're exactly right. When you, we write a note about a family meeting, it's part of the permanent chart. So, Sarah, yeah. did you have a question? Oh. Okay. Plus, you can, uh, physicians can bill for um, meeting. Wait, uh, they can? Yes. You have well, to examine the okay. patient, combine it together, your exam, and then you have to document that the family meeting took place. So it is uh, billable first half hour as an addition or an hour meeting. If you run the meeting uh, three hours, it's not billable. You can only bill for up to an hour. So it's not acceptable. The system doesn't give you many hours to run this kind but of But if you meeting. think about it, it's an hour in preparation. It's an hour in running it. It's probably an hour in follow-up. So you're telling us half of that is unreimbursed. Right. Yeah, and that, and you have to come up. It is ideal to follow uh, Terry's recommendations and the format of the uh, family meeting, but this should not uh, discourage you to meet families that is going to be like very uh, costly time-wise, and you have to see 10 more patients, right? Which is what we need to do. So. Sometimes there are consensus on many, you know, issues, and you can run a very focused family meeting, and it's always absolutely uh, any meeting to me that takes three hours is out of control. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, we should not be taking three hours for a family meeting, and in fact, sometimes may happen. Very but uh, cases, uh, but so. uh, the, that's off the center curve. Right. Right. Off the center <laughs> curve. <laughs> yeah. If we're sitting around for, uh, uh, that's part of our. Uh, Self-evaluation. Or follow-up meeting. So first meeting, you came up with some kind of, um, you started negotiating the goals of care, and there's a conflict, and you may reschedule another meeting just yes. to follow up. So you don't have to drag it or try to get uh, some sort of outcome from the meeting. So it shouldn't be stressful. Either. The other thing, just let me say this uh, quickly, and I'm not sure what Dr. Uh, or Eddie's uh, uh, thinking about this is, or anybody's thinking, um, sometimes physicians leave. There's a, there, it's, this family meeting is focused in such a way where, and we say out loud, Dr. Blah Blah is going to be here for 20 minutes. Exactly. We want to use this 20 mm -hmm. minutes. We can do that. I mean, you it, yeah, I absolutely. You yeah. And you, because you have no other choice. Okay. Well, and plus, sometimes it's very productive right. and useful. As, as yeah. So before we end, uh, are there any questions? Oh. Is everybody um, sitting here ready to run their own family meetings? Because guess what? We're going to be doing this really soon yes. um, for the last few months with help and, and um, you know, feedback. We want to make sure that the trainees leave here what and know how here? to run their own family meetings. So any questions before we break? Okay. Thanks well, a lot. We'll see you in the family meetings. And, um, <laughs> thank you. See you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Here you go.